Um, if you are just now joining us, this is our table standing on the front lines, Indo Blacks Advocates and Allies Conference. Today, we have an amazing panel of women and an amazing moderator. I would love, 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 love to introduce Elizabeth, who is the moderator for today. Elizabeth L. Smith is an American radio personality, producer, and writer. Elizabeth pursued her career in journalism at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, receiving her degree in journalism and electronic media in 2014. She established a position in promotions with 92.9 The Game and a couple years later saw opportunity, an open opportunity with his sister station V103. She began working as a, on, as a board operator and took up an interest in producing. She was then afforded a promotion to producer of the midday show at V103. Within her first years of working in the fast top 10 market radio industry, Elizabeth earned time on air as a weekend personality, media correspondent, and a daily contributor to articles online for intercom at radio.com. Elizabeth has been battling endometriosis since 2011 and just recently had her third surgery that brought her great news. After years of surgeries and chron chronic pain, she is now stage one endometriosis instead of stage four. So I would love to bring to you, Elizabeth, thank you so much for doing this and coming to the stage and wanting to basically share your skills and talents with us. I will definitely hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Lauren, for such a beautiful introduction. Uh, you look lovely. I want to say congratulations to you for putting this together. It's so amazing. And to all of my beautiful ladies on the panel, your smiles are just making my morning. I love the yellow, so I'm so excited to be here. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm so glad and honored to be here to talk with warriors who have taken on motherhood so bravely. Of course, we're all gathered here to bring awareness, celebrate and uplift women who have to deal with the condition that sadly affects 176 million reproductive age women daily. Now we all know that endometriosis isn't an easy battle to fight. It can also be a scary one, but that is why conversations in communities like these are so very important. So thank you everyone in the comments, everyone on the panel for joining us. Um, now, before we hop into the conversation about how endometriosis affects motherhood, I would love for everyone on the panel to briefly say your name and tell us when you were diagnosed with endometriosis. So anyone can go first, no particular order. Anybody? I can go first. It's nobody wanted to go ahead and take the lead. So, <laughs> Bonnie Spoon. Um, so my endometriosis started when I started my cycle at age 12, and then I was not diagnosed until 23 years later, wow. uh, which was not so long ago, but yeah. Wow. For my myself, hi, my name is Karine, and uh, for myself, I... I think like um, uh, Bonnie said, um, you know that you have endometriosis from your first period, but you you don't get diagnosed until later. So I got my first period at the age of nine, which was completely abnormal and got diagnosed um, in 2009. So it took, it took a while before I even got the diagnosis. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kylie Kanzader. I knew I had endometriosis when my cycle first came on, similar to the other women on the panel. Um, I had really, really bad cycles in high school, but it took me almost 10 years to figure out exactly what it was. So I was diagnosed in 2013 um, and I was 29 then, So, and I'm 35 now. So it's been eight years knowing I've had endometriosis. I am Leanna Douglas of Hope Still Stands. Hello, beautiful ladies. Um, I started my cycle at the age of 10 and um, with the bad cycle that I had and the bleeding and clotting, um, I believe I had endometriosis around that time. That's when it started. And then I wasn't properly diagnosed until I was in my 20s. And that was after going through eight years of infertility and they finally diagnosed me with, endometri uh, with endometriosis, so. Wow, wow, well. I can finish it off the same. I started my cycle, I believe that was 10. 
Um, but, and I even had my first surgery at age 19, but even then I still wasn't diagnosed with endometriosis. I didn't get my diagnosed until I believe 2019. So I was 25 at the time. So took me a while as well. And I'm sure everyone in the comments, all of our participants could probably attest to the same thing. So now let's transition to the questions because I know that's what we're all here for. First, I wanna start off and ask, what is it like being a mom with endometriosis? Lord, it's not easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, honestly, I think for the longest, you no. Know, once you find out you have endometriosis, you go on this journey of like, I just want to get pregnant. I just want to be blessed with the opportunity of becoming a mom. Um, and then when you become a mom, you realize like now you have to figure out how to take care of yourself as well as taking care of your family. And that is like a, a really big balancing act. Um, of self-care at the same time, nurturing and caring for your little one. Um, so for me, I would say it is a blessing. I would not take it back in any scenario, um, but it has made me uh, prioritize my self-care and prioritize being pain-free and staying pain-free. And part of that is realizing that stress um, can either increase your pain or, you know, actually learning how to managing it, manage it better could make your life so much easier as well. So that's been my journey, just trying to find a way of being pain-free and balancing nurturing and self-care. Understandable. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Um, just on what Kyla said, it, it's, it's knowing when to take that time. It, it's tough as it is uh, not having a condition to be a mom, uh, but to add on to the equation being in pain. It, it, and then, you know, with society having this, the mom guilt of not being able to function well when you want to do uh, certain things with your kids. Um, for my experience, it had been having to miss, you know, baseball or um, practice or soccer or, you know, certain things that are meaningful to the family as a whole. And, you know, you just laying down there and that you can't do anything about it. So knowing when to take that um, that self care and having those boundaries as a mom with endometriosis is essential. Yeah, um, I'll tell you, it was rough because um, mine. I would say mine got worse when I was pregnant with my first one. Um, I was five weeks pregnant, and they sent me home to um, miscarry. So I went home. I took a week off just waiting for the process and um, he's stuck there. So I will say he's 11, year old, 11 years old now. Um, now the second pregnancy, I lost that one at five weeks. He didn't, the baby didn't progress after 10 weeks. Um, so technically I was 10 weeks pregnant, but the baby didn't progress after five weeks. Um, and then the third one, which is Dylan, my shadow, he, um, I was pregnant with him and my, I started spotting. I was spotting every day. And I knew at that point that it was over, right? And so um, I went to the doctor and they said, well, you're going to have to go on progesterone. So I went on progesterone. I was sick. If you've ever been on progesterone, you get really sick from it. And um the only issue with me was that I was a little bit more sicker than I should have been. So I called my pharmacy and I said, what are the ingredients that are in this? And they said, well, the first ingredient is peanut oil. I'm allergic to peanuts. And so um, I had to stop. And so when I went to the doctor, I said, you know, there's no way you should have prescribed me this. You had all my records and they apologized, whatever. But they said, you're going to have to stop. Like you can't, there's no way you're going to be able to take this any longer. It's making you too sick. And so she said, by the, at this point, you're just going to have to pray every day that he sticks there. And he stuck there, but the issue was that my fibroid grew with him. So um, 
Can you get down for one second, Dylan? I have to show something. So as my fibroid was growing, and I'll just give you a visual. Um, as my fibroid was growing on this side, the baby could only move in a C because the fibroid was covering this part of my body. So as I'm bringing in nutrients, the fibroid was taking it first, baby. So my first son was eight pounds, one ounce, right? Dylan was only six pounds and some change. So um, kind of, you know, it was really rough for me. Mm -hmm. I only in nine pounds throughout the whole pregnancy because all my nutrients were going to the fibroid. So now he's out in, he's my sidekick. <laughs> He don't leave my side. I don't know what he gonna do when he go to kindergarten in, in August, but this is my sidekick. Oh, <laughs> way <Where are you> Dylan. <laughs> I love that. It's so strong. Um, for me, um, with having um, my daughter, um, she's our miracle. I have a little bit of a different situation, but kind of similar to what Vani said. I have a didelphus uterus, so I have a double uterus and a double cervix. And then I had the endometriosis as well. So um, after having her, we actually, ha I had her seven weeks early. And um, I just figured as most people do, they don't know a lot about endometriosis that the pain would get better after she was born. I'm like, well, I got pregnant and had a baby. It should be better. No, the pain came back and the clotting came back and trying to you know, change a diaper or run after a toddler. And as she's growing, and she wants to do things and I'm in pain. And I'm like, you know, you have to go with your father because I'm cramping or, you know, laid over in bed, sleep, knocked out because I'm in so much pain. So um, you do have that mom, mom guilt. Um, you think like, I'm not doing enough, but you have to take care of yourself. You have to um, take the time to, you know, take your medication, take warm baths, get your heating pad. If you have to sit in a quiet place, that's okay. Don't feel like you're not doing enough because you have to take care of your fir yourself first before you can take care of others. So I agree with all of you ladies. Wow. So that leads me to my next question. Um, we hear a lot about how it may be difficult to conceive. And for you ladies, if you did experience that, what inspired you to keep trying and to keep pushing? Like, I want to become a mother. Like, what was it that stuck with you to want to go on this journey of motherhood? So, um, to be honest, I, we were like, okay, we're one and done. After I had the miscarriage after the second pregnancy, I was like, okay, one and done. Like, I can't keep doing this and going through the stress of it. Right. So I scheduled my, um, well, the doctor scheduled my hysterectomy and, um, I would say the day of my pre is when I found out about me being pregnant with them. And they told me, like, we had been trying for over a year to get pregnant. And they were like, this is it. Like, there's nothing else you can do. And so right before I went in, I was like, um, this thing says positive. I'm pretty sure this isn't right. But what's funny is that my oldest son, he knew we were trying. Like, he was part of the process. You know what I mean? And he kept telling me, he was like, mom, you got to stop looking. You got to wait until God says it's ready, right? And I'm like, who are you, right? So then um, finally, I saw that smiley face pop up. He was like, mom, it's a smiley face. I was like, okay. So I went to my pre-op. She was like, I guess um, God's work is done, huh? And so that was it. And that's when. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. So for me, um, oh, you go. <laughs> so for me was um, uh, I wasn't able to conceive naturally. I was actually prescribed prescri uh, a pregnancy to get rid of endometriosis. So for me, pregnancy was a prescription. I know it might sound like a little uh, like out there and like, wow, you know, prescribe uh, pregnancy. Um, luckily at the time I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 21, I married young, I mean, I married at 20. So I already had a year. It was expected for me to have children eventually. And when I had um, surgery, the doctor said, well, 
you are able to um, you're able to conceive um, naturally now after you had surgery. So I said, well, okay, that should be fine. You know, I had surgery, the endometriosis was removed, then I should be fine. So I fast forward, like I said, I'm going to try for um, just to conceive naturally. Internally, I wasn't ready to have kids. I was just 21. And um, I said, well, if it will happen, um, then let it be just like Bunny says, you know, you let it up to God and see if he will. And in my mind, it was said that I was not going to have kids. And it wasn't until um, I did naturally uh, for about a year, a year and a half. And the endometriosis just kept going and, and growing. And I wasn't getting a, um, getting pregnant. So the doctor was like, well, you know, the only way you'll be able to get pregnant at this point is if you um, have IVF and you... Um, just go through it that way. If not, we're going to have to do a hysterectomy because endometriosis is just um, going and you won't be able to have kids. So right there, I was like from like just stuck in the middle because I said, well, if I have a chance to have a baby, uh, the IVF might be. And you know, I didn't want to make the choice for me not to remove that completely, that option. And even for my husband as well as a partner, not to um, you know, to put that decision. So um, yes, and I said, well, is uh, after the pregnancy, am I gonna be all done with endometriosis? Oh yeah, it has been proven that women, when they get pregnant, they get better. And I said, oh, okay, then I should be fine then. I'm not gonna have a pain when I have a baby. Oh. I went through the whole pain of IBF because it was so painful. And not only that, um, you get guided to do IBF, but you, you don't get counsel in um, how it will affect emotionally, psychologically, um, how physically it will um, affect you. And I went through all the, uh, I would say, you know, all the facts and, 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 and feeling so depressed throughout the whole process. Not only that, the hormones that you're given through IBF, they're so damaging for your body that after I, I had to be on bed rest for the whole pregnancy because I was having um, the issue that Bonice was having that um, I couldn't even stand up and I would start con con uh, having contractions and bleeding. So in order to for the pregnancy to be a viable pregnancy, I had to be laying down the whole pregnancy. So I spent the whole pregnancy laying down just to find out that after um, I, I had to have a C-section because the baby, it, it was just such a complication, like um, from the beginning to the end, even while having um, uh, the baby, I had to have, since the endometriosis that I had um, was around my colon and I had to have a, a coronary section when um, prior to the baby, when they did the C-section, um, the baby had to come out and they cut. And when they do the tug um, to take out the baby, they move my intestines and they enter into a shock. So when that happened, I wasn't able to pass gas. I wasn't able to have a bowel movement. So I stay after um, delivering, I stay two weeks at the um, delivery unit just to be able to find out what was going on. So I had to be intubated within that period. And, and to me, that was my, my welcome into motherhood. And I said, what did I do? What, what just happened? Like I was completely fine. And for a moment I said, oh, I feel this guilt. I honestly didn't wanna look at my baby. I said, I don't know why I, I, I follow an order and I just, I just couldn't see my baby just the way that other mothers were. They were happy to see their baby. And I, I, just, I just couldn't bear the feeling. I was like, oh, wow, this is just going to be, if this is only the beginning, it's just going to get harder from here. What am I going to do? And I said, well, at least they said that I'm going to uh, be better after I have the baby. So maybe this, there's a good outcome after this. 
So fast forward, <laughs> six months, um, I started breastfeeding because as well, the, the, um, you get delayed of the menstrual cycle. So I breastfed and um, that was another journey of its own <laughs> after a C-section. So when I went into um, that six months after starting breastfeeding, I start seeing the period. I said, oh my God, um, it's painful again. And I went back and I said, well, you said I was going to be okay. Oh, well, you know, the stories. <laughs> so again, I fell into this, like, well, motherhood, a baby, pain. What am I going to do? And the next option was um, to have the hysterectomy. But it so happened that I already had uh, frozen embryos from the IVF. And I wasn't going to let that go. I said, I already seen my baby. I already see how he's growing. That's all the babies there. How am I going to like just toss them basically? And I felt that guilt. And I said, well, if it's meant to happen, then I'm going to go. So within six months of having my baby, I went back to get pregnant again. So, um, they said, well, this will be your chance. Then that way we will be able to remove your um, uterus after that and you'll be done with kids. And I said, yes, let's just do it. I, I don't care. I'm just in pain and I can't deal with this. So I said, well, and you know, maybe I don't even get pregnant. The chances are so slim of getting pregnant, even with like a frozen embryo. And then after all this, and part of me was just like, well, I, I just want to get it rid, like get it over with and just try and see what happens. So I go, <laughs> and funny enough, I only had one, um, I had three embryos that were frozen. Only one um, was uh, viable and made it through. And I said, well, only one is not going to do the pregnancy what are the odds of that? The odds were very strong and I had my miracle baby. So I had another baby, but now I'm pregnant with a toddler. And, <laughs> and I said, okay, all right. Now I have to set myself into, yes, motherhood. But I'm telling you, I, motherhood wasn't even sitting on me when I was already carrying another baby. And it, it has been a journey. Definitely the second pregnancy was not easy. I had my fears of the first pregnancy. I had my fears of the delivery being so painful and being um, complicated just as the first one uh, was. So definitely I, I had to do a lot of advocacy for myself because I knew that the pregnancy, I said, hey, if I had a C-section, you better be sure not to tug around with my intestines because I had this surgery and I don't want to get into a shock. So that's where little by little my advocacy started happening because I saw that the doctor, they really didn't know what they were talking about 100%. So I had to step in a bit more um, towards the end. And um, yes, I did get my uh, second baby and I uh, came out healthy and I love them to death, but to tell you that the guidance towards it was very misleading and um, that it has been a, a tough journey is honestly an understatement. It's, it's tough. And, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean that to scare anyone away from motherhood, but to be able to realize that you know, you are stepping in with um, with different uh, uh, with different strength, and and you'll be guided. You have that strength uh, given by God and and power, but at the same time, mentally, you have to prepare yourself because if not, it will just trickle you down to down bits. You know. And I don't want to take all the time, but yeah, that was, <laughs> it, it was <laughs> the journey. Oh, that was, thank you so much for being transparent and honest with us. Um, I don't know, Kayla, if you have a, a story to share, would you like to? Yeah, so um, I will say I was in a little teary eye when she was talking because I still have a little PTSD about my whole birthing scenario. Um, so I guess, let me first say, if you've had a miscarriage, having a miscarriage does not mean you can't have a child. I have definitely had a miscarriage before conceiving my son. Um, and then I went to the doctor. We had conversations about like, 
and let me be clear. So before I was, before I had Clay, I was dating my husband. Um, we were not married in any way, shape or form. And I went to the doctor because I had a cervical cancer scare. And he told me, hey, if you wanna get pregnant, you're gonna to have to either do it now or you're gonna to need to have surgery within the next six months. Um, and I literally went, went to my then boyfriend and was like, hey, like, I don't know what you got planned, but I'm just letting you know, like, this is where I am. You know, like I prayed about this. I have affirmed the fact that I'm gonna be a mom one day. I affirmed the fact that I'm gonna be a wife. Like, let me know, like, it is what it is. And he's like, you know what? Like, um, I know what I wanna do. I know that we're meant to be together, let's try. So we tried, and I think the biggest thing when you're trying is to in, have fun, like enjoy the process. Try not to stress about it because once you become stressed, it's like you're blocking your own blessing. You have to have fun in the process. So we we definitely, we threw it out there. We left it out there. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be. Um, we conceived clay. <laughs> We got married uh, while I was pregnant and, you know, courthouse wedding and all that jazz. And I can say I had a great pregnancy. Um, I had fibroids as well. They were growing while pregnant with clay, but uh, they didn't grow super big. So I was blessed in that factor. Um, however, when we got ready to deliver clay, <laughs> that is where like all of uh, the drama kind of hit the fan. Um, I feel like when you're, especially a black woman and you are going through something of this nature, um, it's really important to advocate for yourself. Um, when we went into the hospital to have Clay, it was Labor Day weekend, hospital was crazy. Um, they couldn't bring me back uh, for a room. They didn't have a room. So I literally was, um, in the lobby, just like having so much pain to the point where it was a family that was there that came over and said, why are they taking you back? Do you not have insurance? Like what's, why, why can't they just, you know, take you back? And it just brought back all this, these emotions of just like fighting for my health, right? Like fighting to be heard with endome about endometriosis. And it was probably um, one of the most uh, hardest moments of my life. Um, we ended up having to have a C-section. Um, the epidural wasn't taking. They hit me three times with the epidural, just was not taking. Maybe it was my pain tolerance. I don't know, but um, they ended up putting me under. So my husband couldn't be in the room when we had Clay. Um, and then, you know, same as Karina, I thought like, okay, well, great. Like that part's over. I'm going to be able to wake up and enjoy my child, um, not the case. <laughs> I ended up having a severe infection from my C-section. Um, I had a stay at home nurse with me in my house for about three months. And you know, it's like during that time you think like that's the time that you're supposed to have with your child to bond. And you're trying to breastfeed and you're taking so many medications at the same time to take care of yourself. And it's not easy, right? Um, and even to this point, uh, my husband's like, hey, let's try for another. But I'm still dealing with all of that. So again, it's not, it's not impossible. Um, if I could give any advice, I would say, get yourself a doula. <laughs> um, just because you have been through so much with your life, I don't care if your insurance can pay for it. You need a doula. You need somebody there to advocate for you, to help you through that process. Because um, being pregnant with endometriosis, there's so many other factors at play, you know, and it can turn left at any time. Um, and it's just important, especially if you're pregnant now um, through the COVID world and not being able to have your family around, get a doula, um, get somebody in there with you that can really advocate for you throughout your appointments while you're delivering and afterwards because there can be something that happens where you're, you can leave that hospital and just be okay 
And similar to myself, two weeks down the line, you're trying to figure out like, why is my stomach not going down? Like, why do I have this pus coming out here? And you can Google and it can say it's fine, but realistically you could be in a place of really concern. So get a doula no matter what, um, and just know that it's possible. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna yeah. try not to be Violet, to add on to that, just know that if you get a doula, there are people and organizations that will pay for it for you. Yes. So that it should not be an option for you. And even if you are concerned about not having um, maternity leave, there are organizations that will provide you money for your maternity leave as well. You just have to do your research. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that information. And Kayla, thank you for your story. You're so powerful. So powerful, all of you women. And that leads me to, to ask, um, we all know that endometriosis not only attacks your physical, but obviously your mental as well. So, you know, you go through postpartum, then you have to add endometriosis to that, which can be a whole nightmare. So how do you all cope with your mental health? Did you seek counseling, meditation, rituals? Like, what did you do? I did not, with my first one, I did not know that I had um, postpartum until my first child was 14 months. And um, one thing that you have to realize is that with women of color, we, we struggle to ask for help because we feel like we're, we're these strong black women that doesn't need this, this psychiatrist or um, psychologist because we're being looked at as if we're crazy. But I had a... Um, I went through the postpartum with my first one and that was a rough ride. And to this day, I am still taking um, antidepressants just as a kind of like a maintenance type of thing because it's been at this point, it's been 10 years since I've been struggling with it. But with my second one, you know, with my pregnancy, I couldn't take any medicine. You know what I mean? So with him, I said, I just kept in my head, like, yeah, the first one, I lost my hair. I had traditional locks. I had to cut all my hair off, right? So then the second pregnancy, I said, listen, this time, my mentality is up to me. Like, I have to think about this psychologically. So after I had my first one, literally the moment after I pushed him out, I got in the shower. I put on running clothes. I put on shoes. And I said, I'm ready to go. The doctor's like, well, you're in pain meds. I said, no, ma'am, I haven't even taken a Motrin. So that was that. But then I said, well, after my six weeks of being home, I was like, I'm going back to work. Babe, you stay home for two weeks until this child gets his first set of shots. I'm, I can't, I'm not going to stay home and let this sit in me. You know what I mean? Because I know that it's going to happen, right? And I decided that I was going to breastfeed my white male OBGYN. This is a new one. He said, I want you to breastfeed and I want you to breastfeed for a long time because this is what's going to delay you from going back into the hospital. I breastfed for 15 months. And as I'm hitting this 15 months, that's when I'm seeing that my cycle was starting to come back. So just so you know, you if you know your body, you have to pay attention to your body. Nobody knows your body, but you. That's why you have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to have self-awareness. I am so self-aware. Like I literally have a lot of awareness about myself. So pay attention to you and what your body needs and what your body wants. So it's very, very important to do that. I had reached to the point of no return when I hit that, when my son hit that 14 months. And at that point, they can't diagnose it as postpartum. At that point, it was depression. So just listen to your body. Wow. Yana, did you, did you have anything to add to that? Yes. Um, for, for me, I, I agree with what Vanis was saying, um, being, you know, your own advocate. Uh, after going through eight years of infertility, we tried IVF, like um, Kareen said, we tried IVF and that whole process was just mentally like um, war on me and my husband. He had to do the injections in my belly. Then I'm like nervous going to work. I'm like, my belly is swollen and I'm in pain, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like hopeful that I would get pregnant, you know, after doing IVF. 
And then the IVF, we got our results back after we did the transfer and um, the results was negative. So I sprouted into this depression. Uh, it was so dark for me. I would smile in front of everyone else. Uh, when I would see other women pregnant, um, other family members pregnant, uh, or having kids, I would be so depressed. I would be so jealous of them. But I spiraled into um, such a dark spot where I almost committed suicide. So um, if you don't speak out, like it took a long time for me to actually admit that. Um, I felt like it was my fault. I would push my husband away when we couldn't get pregnant because of the endometriosis and because of my diadelphus uterus. I would push him away. I was like, you can marry someone else. You could have had two or three kids by now. So I was in this really dark um, space. So now fast forward, my daughter is eight years old. Our daughter is eight years old. Now I'm in secondary level of infertility. But my mindset is different. It's like, like you said, being your own advocate, loving yourself. Um, now I'm like, you know what? You know, there are brighter days ahead. Um, I know I'm going through this. I just actually three weeks ago had a myomectomy and a hysteroscopy where they removed three fibroids and opened both of my cervixes. So I know you get into this space like, why is this happening to me? But you know what? Your story will help someone else. So I'm in such a better place. When I think of myself in my 20s, I was, I'm telling you, looking at the knives to see which one would be sharp enough to cut my throat. That's how, you know, dark of a space I was in. And now I'm like, you know, I'm hopeful. You know, I, I'm looking forward to what's to come. I'm three weeks post-op um, post for my surgery that I had in February. And I'm looking forward, forward to the future. So, yes. Elizabeth, if I could add something first. Uh, the chat is amazing. Y'all have so much feedback over here. I hope yes. <laughs> because... I'm going to need all that. <laughs> um, but one thing that helped me a lot, I'm, I'm, I consider myself an herbalist, um, but one thing that if you're dealing with depression, get you some St. John's warts tea. Um, it has been used to help with depression. It has been used in a lot of different medications. I feel like that has helped me a lot with my mood changes just, just in general. Um, so do your research on that and really look into that because that that's something that I keep in my house always. Um, and then also, um, I think Bonnie was talking about um, the breastfeeding. To me, it's not the pregnancy that they should be diagnosing women with endo. It's the breastfeeding part. Like it's, it's that part that will get you to a place of like really getting your endometriosis down to a place where you can learn how to control it by either changing your diet with your vitamins and things of that nature. I can Listen, say take it as a positive kind yes. of thing. I get to eat, I ate everything I wanted and some more. Yes. The guy, said, yeah, eat all the cake, all the cake you want. I'm hard. Uh -huh. <laughs> you ain't said nothing. I ain't gained no weight. But meantime, my baby was fat and I yep. love it. Yep. It's the same here. And I will say, when you do stop breastfeeding, all of a sudden you have these hunger cravings and then you have that curve of gaining weight back. So I'm at that curve. So I breastfed, it, breastfed my son until it was just awkward for my husband to watch. So we stopped breastfeeding at two and really like even a little past two, don't tell my husband, but yeah, a little past two, he would sneak in the room. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was selfish of me because I knew it was helping me. Like, honestly, like it was times where I could feel my cycle coming on. I'm like, come on, Clay. And he would latch on and the pain would go away like automatically. And um, I even looked and researched about how I could just be a wet nurse because I'm like, y'all can keep this milk. If you want it, you can have it, whoever wants it. So as much as you can pump out that milk after your pregnancy, you are in a great, great place. So I'm not gonna lie, Kyla, I still got milk in the refrigerator because my- <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and it affects his skin, even though he's about to be five next month, his skin, so allergies and asthma, mm -hmm stuff affect the skin as well mm. you better go and take a milk bath <laughs> yes, yes. 
Wow. So that's great information. I know for myself and probably for a lot of women in the chat as well, who didn't have this knowledge, because like you said, you don't really hear this information from doctors. You just hear get pregnant, get pregnant, you know, the pressure of that. So thank you for giving us these gems. So lady, I hope you guys are taking notes and taking this all in because we definitely need it. So this next question is for mothers who have daughters. Um, do you ever question or wonder if your daughter will have to go through the same thing? Like, is this hereditary? And what measures are you going to take to make sure that your daughter can be endo free? Yes, for me, um, that's the first thing when, when they actually, when I became pregnant and I went in for that, I think there was the 10 week ultrasound. Um, and they, uh, well, actually it was 18 week ultrasound. And they said, you know, you're having a, a daughter. And I said, does she have one kidney? Cause I only have one kidney as well. And they said she has two kidneys. And so I was thinking in my mind, oh my gosh, the journey I've been on with having bad periods since the age of 10, having accidents at school, accidents at work, almost lost my job because I had to leave because I had black, uh, blood on my khakis. And the manager calling me saying, you're gonna lose your job if you don't come back and count your till, count your money in your till. So all the things that I went through, being embarrassed, asking people, can you look at my bottom to see if I'm having an accident on my pants? Um, I just don't want her to experience that. So now that she's eight years old and I started my period at the age of 10, my radar is up. I'm like, when she gets to that age, when she starts her period, I'm going to be letting her doctor know what I've gone through, all the laparoscopic surgeries and the endometriosis and my double uterus, letting them know, hey, I need you to do everything that you can to make sure that my daughter is taken care of, that there's no issues. I will be her advocate. She may not know the questions to ask, but I do. So I definitely um, will be aware and ready when that time comes so that she doesn't have to go through what I went through. Right, I and mean, it's so true. Um, my, I, my mother didn't have it, but she knew, like I would preach to my mom time and time again, like something isn't right, something is going on. I knew it wasn't IBS because you know, that's what they try to tell you were like. That's you know, what they did to me. They told me I had IBS. I was like, the devil is a lie. A whole lie. <laughs> and you know, they, they wanted to put me on birth control at such a young age. And my mom as a black woman is already like, no, you know, we're not gonna follow these stereotypes. Like something is wrong with my daughter. So I can say that having my mom be an advocate for me and being in every doctor's appointment, having a notebook and taking down everything that I was going through and pushing these on the doctors definitely helped to bring me relief. Now, obviously it took a long time to get the diagnosis, but it was, it was important to have my mother there and present and to speak for me when I couldn't, or when I was in too much pain, or I was, you know, too shy or didn't know how to articulate. So that is very much important. Um, and, you know, for the rest of the mothers, have you had a talk with your kid or kids about what endometriosis is and what actions to take? Say if you do have a bad flare up and mommy can't be mommy in the moment. Yeah, I, I have, I'll share. Um, I have two boys. They're eight and six, but um, being able to explain to them uh, you know, what endometriosis is. And whenever I had the flare ups or whenever I wasn't feeling well, and also being able to explain to them as future partners of women later in life um, to be supportive. Because now it's not only the job of um, the mom of a woman, of, of, of a girl to um, tell them and advocate for, uh, for them, but also of, as mother of boys to teach them that there are women with certain conditions, that there will be women with uh, some health conditions, that they will need to be there um, as supported as possible. So, um, you know, me explaining to them that I was going to be needing uh, more of their help around the house or, um, you know, just certain little things that they're able to do just so mommy could feel better and not so stressed, you know, and, and explain to them that this could be something that they might be able to help their wife or their girlfriends later on with, you know, opens up that conversation conversation about um, periods and I eight and six might sound uh, young to explain 
um, in regards to periods, but you know, just in a very childish and uh, natural way, explaining that this is a natural process. So the earlier where we start um, breaking that stigma, that part of being disgusting, that part of you know our periods being shameful the better it will be for our future. And I think it starts with us, you know, it, as soon as you explain to a child, yes, it's natural to bleed and that blood is not disgusting. It's just part of a woman. It's just what that woman uh, cycles through is what the woman um, goes through. It, it just breaks that stigma. Now, when they see in their high school years, they see a girl that is um, menstruating, instead of feeling disgust or turning her away, they'll be like, hey, do you need some help? Let me give you that sweater and cover you up. So you go and do your thing. So she doesn't feel shameful. She feels supported, you know? And, and I think uh, as a mom, we, we definitely, um, as a mom of boys, we have to teach them. We, we have to, to break that, that, um, that stigma around periods with our boys, you know, and teach them and, and not be shy about it, shy about um, our bodies and sharing with them. Yeah, so my kids, my oldest knows about the whole one in 10 thing. Um, and it's, he knows about it because of, you know, remember, he knew about the process of me trying to get pregnant the third time. Now, my little one, he's like, mommy, is your mommy Mitris hurting? I'm like, son, I said endometriosis. Mommy Mitris, does it hurt? I'm like, yes, honey, mm -hmm, it hurts. So in 2019, I had my hysterectomy, and that's when that's when I needed a lot of help. You know what I mean? And so Dylan was just like, oh, mommy, you want me to take a bath for you? You want me to help you? You want me to wipe your butt? No, sir. Mm -mm. You're going too far, but you can do that for your wife though. But, you know, kids know more than you think. You know what I mean? Um, and so you have to help them with their curiosity. Um, I will say that I was, my doctor, he talked to all of us about it. This is my white male doctor. And he told me, he said, you know, in extremely rare, um, it's extremely rare for men to get endometriosis, but it happens and it happens in their urinary tract. So, um, so it is possible. So they know about it. I've explained, you know, that to them as well. Like if you're hurting and something's bothering you, you need to tell me, you know what I mean? Like for me, I am, every woman in my family on my mother's side of the family have all had hysterectomies because of this. Men can get endo. Yes. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pattern. You know what I mean? And so it's just like, when does it stop becoming a pattern? When can we stop this from happening? How do we fix it? You know, and so my son, my oldest, his goal in life is to be a doctor. And, but the first thing that he wants to do is cure cancer. And I said, well, you know, what are you going to do? And so he created this, um, this prototype and he claims that it cures cancer. But what's funny is that, like I said, Kids know something's going on. They may not be able to put their finger on it, but my son, my friend had cancer. She had eye cancer and she went in for a scan and they said, okay, it's back. But then she went in to have surgery. They did the ultrasound. They did the MRI and stuff. She took Dylan I Medeiros' mean, prototype with her. They said, there's nothing there. They sent her back home. So kids, no, there is something with kids like my oldest, he was getting migraines when I was supposed to have my cycles. So there was a period where I wasn't having cycles at all. This was before my hysterectomy. He was getting the migraines. He was throwing up. It was like clockwork every 28 days. And the doctor was like, oh, he's just getting, you know, headaches. It's hormones. They would check everything. Nothing was happening. It happened for nine months until I got my hysterectomy. Oh, that's crazy. So crazy. 
Um, and I know we could probably talk forever about all of this, but we got to get to the question and answers um, from some of the people in the audience. Uh, so if you do have questions, you guys can drop them in the question and answer chat and we will try to get to as many as we can. So this first one that I have here is anonymous. Um, someone wants to know, they said, I know a lot of times there's pain during intercourse. So how do you deal with that? Or how did you deal with that? And is there anything that helps? I, I will add to that. And um, yes, there's been a lot of time, like from the time that I started uh, being active, um, there was always pain. So I had that relation of sex painful, so I never was able to enjoy. So the point that, you know, uh, it, even coming to the subject of um, having intercourse was just very frightening. So at the moment um, that I started seeing that correlation and how I was not able to enjoy having intercourse just like any woman would and the na how nature intended to be, I was directed to work with a pelvic therapist. So if you uh, are having, and, and this is not like recommended enough, which I don't know why, uh, pelvic therapist for women with endometriosis is a must, it's a must. We have so much trauma stored within our womb that we have to work through them. And this is not um, just, the pain that we endure in this lifetime right now in our body, but it's ancestral. And we have to work through those nerves. So what the pelvic therapist does is that she palpate all around your womb, your vagina. So that feeling of letting go of the fear. I had a lot of, um, I was sexually abused. So there was a lot of trauma in that area, which, you know, down the line, I have already done this whole circle of wellness and is where I'm at in, in the work that I do with a lot of women. And um, with the pelvic therapist, they do all these stretches and massages and uh, pressure points just to be able to direct you and lose that, um, lose the fear and understand um, your body more, even more intimate and for you to be able to work um, yourself with your, um, with your vagina and, um, within your own, um, uterus lining and, um, just understanding more what pleasures you, once you let go of that fear, once you let go of that stress, believe me, you feel so much better in welcoming, uh, that species within you and, uh, you know, feeling the pleasure. It, um, now, if you want to add on, there's a lot of, um, um, I'm sure Kyla will probably say if you're like um, an herbalist as well. And um, there's a lot of herbs that work with the womb as well. Um, we always have to lubricate. Even if you have just coconut oil, it's very safe for you to use. Um, as a woman with endometriosis, you have to lubricate. No matter if you lubricate naturally, you have to lubricate. It just makes things easier. There's CBD um, out there, um, which are very helpful um, when it comes to the pain. And listen to your body, because if you feel like, I don't feel like having sex right now, it's no. And it will be even more painful because your body is already um, constricted and it's just tensing up because you don't want to. So don't go about um, against that feeling. If you are at ease, everything will go just as well. But definitely a PT, um, it's my recommendation, my number one recommendation. If you could get a hand of um, coconut oil and CBD, you're good to go. Wow, thank you for answering that. Thank you. The, the next question, um, two, two women have basically asked this question. Can you tell us about your significant other, their help during this journey and how you, I guess, opened up to help them understand the process that you're going through? Yes, my husband has been so supportive. Um, he would just always encourage me, get the heating pad, um, like even recently having my myomectomy, um, I could hardly get up. I had no like muscle strength in my belly and he would pick me up, take me to the restroom and he had to see everything, all the clots and everything. 
And um, I would just explain to him, especially during intercourse, sometimes I'll be in pain and sometimes I would just go through it in the pain so that he could, you know, receive pleasure. And I stopped doing that. I'm like, no, Anna, you have to be honest with him and let him know he's going to understand. So as women, we don't just go through the pain just so that the other person can have pleasure. No, if you're in pain, say something and don't be ashamed of it. So um, yeah, my husband has been so supportive, encouraging throughout this whole process. I mean, going through three laparoscopic surgeries, failed IVF, att IVF attempt, um, then having our daughter seven weeks early and now going through, you know, me having fibroids on top of endometriosis. Um, and then we were diagnosed uh, with, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome as well. And what Kareem was talking about, the pelvic um, therapy, I would always have right vaginal pain since I was in my 20s until now, and I'm 39. And my doctor that just did my surgery recently has referred me to PT, and I'm looking forward to going to this pelvic therapy because um, just to have some type of uh, release and not feeling tense all the time. So I definitely agree with Kareem on that. Wow, wow. Um trying to get to a few more questions. Let me see. Um, Kia wants to know, to those who have had a hysterectomy, are you better now or do you still deal with pain? She said that she's heard some women say it helped them and some women have shared that they still struggle with the pain. So hysterectomies are not a solution. Hysterectomies is only something that will help to number one, with, if your fibroids have ruined your, your, your uterus, then it's got to go. You know, endometriosis can, can, it doesn't just live on your uterus. It can live in your bowel, <clears throat> things like that. So even if you have a hysterectomy, you can still have endometriosis sitting in your bowel. So, and I've had some of my bowel, um, you know, removed. So with that being said, um, I will tell you that I have felt the best I've ever felt um, with having endometriosis. And to be honest, after I had my hysterectomy, I took no meds. That's how much pain I was in before I had the hysterectomy. I didn't take any medicine at all. And um, every now and then I'll have a little bit of a cramp, but nothing like before. But my doctor told me, he said, you're going to live with endometriosis. This is not a solution. And he told me that. But for me, because it had ruined my uterus so much that it just, it had to go. Like my fibroid, he couldn't, you know, it was, he, I had some cysts on my uterus as well, but that fibroid literally lived there. And literally my youngest, when I was pregnant, he was like playing the drums on my uterus. And we have like video of him doing that. Now it sat right here on his face. And then with my first one, that fibroid literally sat in my birth canal. So I almost had to have a C-section. But the moment where they said push, he like moved it out the way with his hands and went through. But I will tell you that there is still pain. It's just a matter of when the pain is going to come back and how severe it will be. This is not a lifetime solution. Like it's going to come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. And just to add on to what Laana was saying about the whole, you know, when you get up having people look at your butt to make sure, girl, I have PTSD. I don't even have, I had a full hysterectomy. I still keep pads. I still keep underwear in my purse and my car. When I get up, I still look back and the doctor's like, what are you looking for? When I go to the Cairo and I'm like, oh, I'm just checking to see if I left my keys or anything, you know, just trying to play it off. But yeah, it's. PTSD is real. So even though you don't have the pain from the hysterectomy, I mean, from the endo, you still have it in your head thinking that, oh, it, it's still going to happen. Anytime I have a cramp, I'm like, oh, it hits me. Like, okay, it's, it's, it's coming back. It's coming back. But then I remember, oh yeah, that thing is gone. <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, Kayla, I think maybe you might be able to answer this next question. It comes from Crystal. And she asked, is there any diet recommendations for endo when you're trying to conceive? 
Oh, yes. Well, just a, a, a diet in general, right? I think uh, Tia Mori had it down pat last night. It's, it's uh, you have to do a life changing diet um, just in general. And to me, it's diet, vitamins, stress um, that you have to monitor, right? So, and and even when you're doing your diet, you have to do it in a way that you're enjoying it. So you have to find things that are that kind of fulfill those those appetites of yours. Because what you do find is if you go on a diet that is completely different than what you like, it will stress you out. Then all of a sudden you have to deal with your stress and then your endo is causing you stress. So it is a cyclical process. So one thing for myself that worked, um, I'm from the South. I love fried foods, had to get rid of fried foods, right? Um, automatically. And then, but it was a process of, okay, well, let me try to fry something with almond flour instead of regular flour. Let me substitute vegetable oil with avocado oil, like really just trying to find those substitutes. And one thing that worked for me with meat, um, if you are craving meat, buy your meat organic. And if you are ready to get off of meat, mushrooms, oyster mushrooms are God sent. Like you can make them things taste like chicken. <laughs> you can chop it up and make it taste like a steak. Like seasoning is everything. So if you, yes, in an air fryer, Kelly, get you an air fryer ASAP. Um, but I would say that you just have to be very creative with your diet. You have to figure out ways of substituting, substituting things, but be gentle with yourself in the process. Like literally pay attention to what you're eating and then push in things like pushing your greens. Like if you know you're going to crave something that's bad, at least pushing your greens, pushing your water, get apple cider vinegar, put it in your water. It will help detoxify your system. Get you some chlorophyll, put that in your water. That green chlor chlorophyll is really helpful because if you're not eating your greens constantly, like it will overload your body with the good things that you need. Um, but yes. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want to extend it, but I do want to add on that when it comes to um, diet and, and I'll share this because it's what happened to me. I was so um, consuming to doing the endometriosis diet and finding this diet that I developed um, eating disorder. So as soon as I, um, you know, I had to have everything raw, everything vegan, and it was this obsessive way of thinking because I had to get better and my body needed better. I entered into a crash that I wouldn't eat anything until I had, if like, let's say, you know, we're out and there's not an option. I, I used to move in, I used to live in New York City and moved down to Florida. Sadly, the options um, here are not as well and uh, broad as in New York. So I had a hard time um, going out to eat and not finding vegan stuff and not finding gluten-free stuff and not finding raw stuff. So I would just go to restaurants and just end up eating just the lettuce. And, um, you know, it puts you in a stress uh, uh, mode and it just doesn't help your system at all. Stress and endometriosis, it just, uh, you know, it's a bomb. It's like a combination just to flare up. And it was causing all this um, commotion within my body that it just made the endometriosis flare up. So as um, Kyla said, just be mindful, take yourself slow, look for the things that are, um, that are already within your comfort. And yes, do a substitution of certain things, add more greens to it. Um, I would agree, um, supplements are essential uh, for women with endometriosis. Omega-3, your NAC, make sure that you are taking NAC. Women with endometriosis need NAC. And um, there's a lot of herbal um, supplements that are so helpful. I, I started an herbal um, regimen and it's really what has helped with my, with my liver and, um, and, junk, and just cleanses all the, uh, all the toxins. So whenever the word diet comes up, it's very um, triggering and it's good to be mindful when you are doing it. Do something that it feels natural to you. It feels that you're taking care of your body, not that you have to force it.
Right, right, right. So I know, as I said earlier, we probably could have this conversation all day because we all have so many questions and hearing you all's testimonies and stories are just so inspiring. So I would encourage all of my ladies who are um, on this call, reach out to these ladies on the panel. If you have questions, send it their way. I know that they will be transparent, honest, and open with you all. And um, once again, I just thank you guys for sharing your story with us, for being here with us this morning, um, and just having this open conversation that obviously we need more of. So we see you, we appreciate you, we love you. You all are so beautiful, so strong, and thank you for joining me here today. So, and everyone in the comments, thank you so much for, for everything. So I'm going to pass it to Lauren and, and let her close us out. Hello, everyone. Yes, that was an amazing conversation. Um, thank you so much for being very transparent. I know that it takes um, a lot of courage to get up here and do that. And all of you are advocates in your own ways. Um, and that's why, of course, we, we ask you to come because we know that you will be open, honest, and willing to share as much information. And yes, April Christina said it's very informative. Um, our array said it was a great panel discussion. So we just want to make sure that we share because a lot of times we forget that there is hope for some of us. There is opportunity for some of us. And we do not shed a lot of light on that, as well as we don't shed a lot of light on, okay, now I have a child, what's next? So again, thank you so much for sharing and just being very, very transparent.